It's a mean age. But it is going to be a beautiful future as long as we don't f*** it up. I'm Brian McWilliams, and this is Mean Age Daydream, where I bring you unfiltered comedy, criticism, philosophy, and politics with a Mean Age Daydream. Hello again, my friends, my family, my loved ones, and all of you out there that truly hate my guts. Glad you're back here. If only I could be the Howard Stern of your world, I'd be so happy. Come back, hate me, love me, uh, but obviously a little bit of less hair, smaller nose, and way less douchebaggery, and I promise you I will never sell out like that some bitch did. Welcome to Mean Age Daydream, guys. I'm here with a hot ticket show I'm going to be talking about. The top cliche Halloween costumes to avoid. I know you're all getting ready. You're getting geared up to go trick-or-treating, to get drunk, to go get sexy this Halloween season. And I want to tell you what will turn you into a pumpkin and what will turn off the lovely ladies dressed as, uh, I don't know, sexy Bill Nye. (laughs) There's got to be a sexy Bill Nye out there somewhere spewing bullshit. So anyway, guys, welcome to the show. Uh, that is going to be on point. I'm also going to be talking to Adam Choit, a buddy of mine out here in LA, who created a film called The Edited. Uh, this went through the Talesian, I can never say that right, Talesian Nexus. <laughs> It was a program that developed uh, filmmakers coming, trying to be more liberty-centric people into the filmmaking process. Sadly, is no longer around, but Adam will be uh, joining me at the end of the show, talking about his new film, which is out. You can see it for free on YouTube, so uh, stay tuned for that. But first things first. Guys, please do go subscribe to us on Rumble. Subscribe to the Mean Age Daydream YouTube page. Our YouTube, I believe, is back up. You might have noticed that we did not have episodes up last week because YouTube decided in its infinite wisdom that after, I don't know, a year, uh, one video had somehow violated a content policy, so they gave us a strike. Our YouTube page, which has, you know, 6,000, 6,500 subscribers, is shadow banned and always has two strikes against it, which is a big problem, as you might guess. Monetizing, doing super chats, we can't do any of that stuff. So we need to grow the other platforms. Please join us. Rumble, Odyssey, Mean Age Daydream solo feed, the Finding Freedom solo feed. Or if you just want to be super cool, patreon.com forward slash Lions of Liberty, where you can get the new Do Nothing Man. It will be done by the end of this week. And I've said it before, but I really mean it. It's done. All I have to do is make one quick cut, process it, and it's out. That's my libertarian superhero character. It'll be only for our Pride members for a good solid month. Also get Conspiracy Corners, now known as Secrets, Lies, and Cover-Ups. You get Degenerate Gamblers, the comedy and gambling advice podcast we do only for people that are our supporters. Patreon.com forward slash Lions of Liberty or Lions of Liberty locals. Different levels, even up to the point where you can produce shows. I'm going to be doing an interview with Jeff Dice later at the behest of one of our supporters. And you too can have influence on the show. Also, $25, do a monthly call with us. We shoot the shit. We talk about the topics you want to discuss. We tell you the insider stuff, what we're working on for the show. And you can also influence how we do it in your own way by joining us there. So again, patreon.com forward slash Lions of Liberty or lionsofliberty.locals. So top of the show, before I get into my Halloween costumes, the most cliche stuff, which if you want to hear, if you want to read my old archives, there's a website that I have called Welcome to Tardville, because <laughs> you can still say those words back when I created it. Welcome, the number two, Tardville. You can read all my old comedy blogs. It's pretty damn funny. Highly recommend it. But I would do a roundup every year of these costumes. So I figured I'll bring it back around for me in age daydream, which I want to have a little bit more fun with uh, moving forward than just doing straight political whining. So stay tuned for my costume picks. But at first... I got to talk about this John Fetterman guy. If you don't know who John Fetterman is, he's the lieutenant governor in Pennsylvania. I don't know how he got that position. The man legitimately looks like Quasimodo in a hoodie. He's wearing a Halloween costume year round. He's got this massive growth coming out of his back of his neck that's bizarre. And he just had a stroke. Now, I'm not making fun of people who just had strokes. Obviously, that's not great. You can't really control too much about having a stroke. Maybe you should do a little something with smoking, a little something with eating. But... I'm not mocking people that have had strokes. However, 
This guy clearly has something wrong with him. And I don't think it's out of bounds to say that a man who has had a legitimate brain damage incident to the point where he cannot understand conversation, he cannot understand nor speak words properly, not just Joe Biden style, but legitimately during interviews needs to have a teleprompter to put questions into text because that's the way his brain has to function now. Fair to question whether or not he should be in office. That's what Mehmet Oz, Dr. Oz, did, and of course got massive backlash from the left for being so ableist, but it didn't end there. Because it also came out that Fetterman's wife, Giselle Fetterman, a lot of, a lot of Giselles in the news lately. I don't know if how much money she has, probably less than Giselle Bunchen, but Giselle Fetterman had gone after the NBC reporter who had John Fetterman on. Again, this is like NBC News, like a big NBC program, not just the local news, because this guy, because he's running against Dr. Oz, of course, is getting all sorts of free publicity now, as uh, you know, as Quasimodo does. Didn't even have to climb a tower, didn't have to ring a bell, didn't have to do any of it, guys. So he's really, really breaking out that way. But he goes on this, this show, and the reporter explains to the audience... He's got to have this teleprompter, this computer set up because he can't understand what I'm saying. This is done as a consideration. This is done as a favor. They could have just not had him on. They could have let him embarrass himself. And there's plenty of clips out there of him completely breaking down as far as speech goes because his brain is not functioning like a normal brain currently. It's still healing from a stroke. So instead of being grateful for the coverage, what happens? Giselle Fetterman goes out and says that this NBC reporter needs to apologize and the network has to apologize for being ableist. Ableist! Now remember, this guy wasn't disabled before he had a stroke, but now this chick gets to put a merit badge on her Girl Scout outfit, her liberal Girl Scout outfit, her hyper-progressive Girl Scout outfit, a merit badge in the corner that she gets to use the word ableist now. And naturally, that's the new get-out-of-jail-free card for Fetterman. That anybody that dare criticize legitimately question whether or not he has the mental capacity, the capability, the health chops, having just come out of a stroke, to run for office and be a senator, you're ableist. So watch out. But flip side of this, and this is actually what I was going to title the name of the episode before some other breaking news came out. I got to wonder. I got to wonder, because I have a theory that John Fetterman is going to be pushed. Now watch, watch it happen. Again, mind you, I work in publicity. This is the way in which I think these minds work. That John Fetterman will be pushed as some sort of Wolverine-like healing ability because it's not that he's having problems with the stroke. It's that he's healing so quickly that no other human being in history could have possibly done this, could have recovered as fast as Fetterman. He's the new Wolverine, snicked, snicked, claws out. He's going to be calling people Bub anytime now. Mark my words, he will be portrayed as an X-Man in the media. Watch and see. I promise you it's coming. So that's my Fetterman rant. Get that out of the way. Now we'll get into the costumes. This guy's Halloween's coming. Halloween's awesome. Halloween's the best time of the year. Honestly, well, actually, I should say Halloween kicks off the best time of year. Some people like summer. I think summer sucks. I don't like being sweaty. I don't like being hot. I don't like jerk off kids being out of school, running around, clogging up the streets, clogging up my gyms. I don't like running around and seeing them all the time. <laughs> Now, right now, I, I am a parent, by the way, raising two children. Um, I'm not going to allow them outside the summer, obviously. But no, summer blows. Everything about it sucks. My energy will skyrocket. And of course, now, even more so. And it's just an unpleasant time. But fall, mm, kick it off, man. Give me that Halloween spirit. Give me some of that, that pumpkin spice. Get to put a pumpkin out on my front porch. Get to put up my Halloween lights. Get to put skeletons in a bush. What more do you want than skeletons in a bush? And of course, surprisingly, we didn't really hear much about skeletons coming out about the bushes in regards to the Jeffrey Epstein scandals, but I'm, I'm sure they had a part in it. But every year, right, the question now becomes, what's the most cliche costume out there, right? And this is what kicked this whole thing off for me, is that every year I would go out partying and been my hard charge and partying days, which are not fully behind me. I'm going out again this year, trust me. But it used to go much harder. And every year now, I was a single man, and I'd go, hey, okay, i got to get a real good outfit here. I want something that the ladies are going to take pictures with me because, obviously, that's an entree into uh, potentially getting laid, which is always a good thing if you're a single man. So 
I go to these big parties and every year there'd be some asshole costume that people thought was clever or just too lazy to really think too much about that would always be there five, 10, 15 of them. And the worst part would be there'd be costume contests and these dumb asshole, these uncreative shitty costumes would somehow still win it because they were politically motivated by the time. And this has not changed. So I've decided to bring it on back. If I was smart, I would have done an intro and had some spooky, spooky music to play with some nice text. But again, with the kid, my time is still limited until this baby gets a little bit more, uh, <laughs> I don't know, less needful of constant attention uh, where I can put her down and she doesn't scream in my face nonstop. But at least I've ditched her for the hour to give her to my wife. So. Number one on my list here, guys, coming in. I don't know. I don't know what order these in. I think I've got them about right, but we'll see. But number one on my list, I am going to predict with my Nostradamus ball or Nostradamus ball seeing the future that every black chick you know is going to go as Ketanji Jackson Brown, first female African American Supreme Court justice. Why? Well, it's an easy costume. All you got to be is a black chick or not. You don't even have to be a black chick anymore. You can be a black dude now and got dressed as a trans and, you know, throw a wig on. It's all, it's all in bounds, baby. It's all in bounds. I'm sure you're going to see some black dudes dressed as Katanji Jackson Brown, but it's so easy. You get a gavel, you get a black judge's robe. They got them in every Halloween store available or, or just put on a black cape and boom, you are the first black Supreme Court justice. Now you're a social justice warrior. Now you're a Halloween slut with a message. And that is hard to pass up. But I'll give you, tell you what, here's what you're gonna see. You're gonna see a lot of twerking. You're gonna see a lot of gavel banging. You're gonna see a lot of gavel banging on some twerking butts. <laughs> that, that's okay. What would kick this up for me another notch though, what I really wanna see out of it is if some can find a giant gavel, like, a, like I'm talking like seven feet tall gavel that they can use as a strip pole to do the sexy Katanji Jackson Brown. Because, you know, everything's got to be sexy Halloween, which is a good thing. I'm not complaining about that. It all should be sexy. Everything should be sexy on Halloween. No, unless you're opening the door for children, which I think is going to be my lot this Halloween. So, you know, I'll, I'll dress less sexy <laughs> than I usually do around the house, which is very sexy. But I would love to see a little Katanji Jackson Brown. You know, you got the full gavel just getting on it. Mmm, do it, girls. So anyway, that's one. I promise you, if you're going out, you're going to see it. Uh, how about this one? The, in the too soon category, Zombie Queen Elizabeth. Another one, you're going to see it. You're going to see your, uh, I don't know, your girls who like to push the boundaries of good taste. They think they're being clever and edgy. They will be going as Zombie Queen of England, going around, drinking, tapping people, maybe knighting some people on the ground. And, uh, of course, hopefully pointing out that their nephew and or their, uh, their son should get off of that underage child. But another one, the zombie queen of England, you will definitely see. How about uh, Zelensky? Another one. For all your lefty pals out there that want to seem like they're politically active, that want to make a statement, right? Well, another easy costume. If you're a guy... All you got to do, draw on a goatee or grow it out a little bit. His hair is pretty easy to mimic, as if you, if you have it. Of course, I can't get away without wearing a wig. But I did pull off a fantastic Bill and Ted's Excellent Adventure. And I'll tell you guys, oh, shit. I wonder if I could find my Hulk Hogan picture to show you. I did an amazing Hulk Hogan outfit where I legitimately uh, had a blonde wig. I cut the hair off of the blonde wig and then glued it to the sides of my bald head, grew out a mustache, dyed the mustache blonde and looked like the, I guess, I don't know, AIDS real version of Hulk Hogan. <laughs> Since I'm definitely skinnier than him. Nah, I can't find it, but there's some fucking funny pictures of me. Maybe I'll, I'll maybe I'll share it on the, uh, the lions of Liberty.com page for this episode. So go to lions of Liberty.com and you will be able to see that, uh, that photo or go to our Facebook group. If you always want to join the Lions of Liberty Facebook group, you can get in there as well. Although, of course, the private super secret group for the uncancelables, the Lions of Liberty Pride, that you got to pay in Patreon or Lions of Liberty Locals. So, yeah, Zelensky. 
There you go. Here you go. You, don't, you don't have to wear it in your fucking stupid printer, printer file anymore, guys. You can now be the man that you idolize that is uh, just sinking his own country into the mire, that's taking billions and billions and billions and billions of our dollars and uh, handing them out to his own oligarchs in addition to just, you know, stacking his country full of weapons in an effort to combat Russia, which is just him working as a proxy war for the United States and NATO. But I digress. If you're a lefty, you probably are going to want to Zelensky it up. All you got to do is buy some fatigues, slap on a Ukrainian flag, bingo, bango, there you go. Now, if people had balls, they would go as sexy gay dancer Zelensky because he had a music video where he and his comedy buddies back in the comedy days did a whole choreographed routine wearing black leather and high heels, uh, dancing around and, uh, and being very highly sexual. So that's one way to save it. Next, how about everybody's favorite show, Jeffrey Dahmer on Netflix. Another one to avoid because everybody's going to be fucking doing it. Get yourself a goofy blonde wig like Ken, get yourself some big vintage glasses, and then you wear whatever you want. A, a polo shirt and some corduroys. Walk around with a uh, chopped off plastic wang. Maybe you bring a vibrator out, paint it the right way. I don't know. Grab, a, grab some fingers on a necklace and you're Jeffrey Dahmer. You got to avoid it. I mean, it's, it's just, it's too clear. It's too obvious. If you want to make it clever, though, go as the guy that Jeffrey Dahmer killed. No one will know who the fuck you are. Just go around, you know, missing a limb here and there, have some bite marks all over you. That's a funny way to do it, right? That's a funny spin on it. Because that way, you're not the cliche, but you're still tied into the story. You can go as the first little, uh, the little black gay man that he murders. Go as that guy. You know, have some fun with it. Really, man, you know, stink yourself up with some shit. <laughs> you smell like a corpse that's been eaten by Dahmer. Say, you got to flip the script. Next one. I'm wearing a Top Gun shirt right now. I got it five below. Top Gun, easy one, just like Zelensky. It was the most popular movie this year. It's a simple costume that guys think that they will look handsome in. They throw on a pair of aviator shades. They throw on a pair of, uh, you know, of, of flight suits that are easily found at any Army Navy shore. And boom, you're Top Gun. Don't do it. I say that. Meanwhile, that might be what I resort to because I have no time. And then the last one, guys, the last one kind of ties into the Katanji Jackson Brown thing, but I think we are going to see some Roe v. Wades. I think you're going to see ladies out there that are either going to be going as the Supreme Court with you know, some sort of stupid signs on themselves. You're going to see some chicks going out there uh, protesting Roe v. Wade in a group as a Supreme Court justice with some sort of thing uh, saying that their bodily autonomy has been attacked. I don't know exactly what spin these people are going to put on it, but I'm telling you, it is going to happen. I sense it in my bones, right up here, right in my rib cage, where I still have all my ribs, and fortunately uh, stops me from going down to myself like Marilyn Manson, because then I never podcast, frankly. I just, I just would never get it done. All right, so that's going to wrap up my thoughts about cliche Halloween costumes to avoid this year. And let me know if you have other ones that you think would be good. Tweet them at me at Brian McWilliams or tweet them at Lions of Liberty. And I will uh, happily retweet them along and, uh, and share your thoughts on that. Cause I think it'd be pretty funny. Also, I was doing a, a buddy of mine, uh, Pete Zaborski over at retalk, uh, retalks, another social media platform you guys should know about if you're on the more conservative side, although again, it's not going to have to be, but they posted an interesting question. I was curious to see what the answers were, which is what a new squad, a GOP squad right? Like those, uh, those nutty ladies on the left have their squad. What would a GOP squad be like? What would people want that to be like in this, uh, in a conservative space? And what would it be called? Because obviously the squad, terrible name. Let's see, is there a better GOP name? I don't know. I'm curious to see what the thoughts of that are. All right, excuse me. I'll look up there. Moving on. And by the way, I think next week we're going to be doing uh, either next week or the week after a Halloween episode, drinking episode, which is always a lot of fun. I'm going to see if I can get my uh, my fellow Lions back on the show and just kind of shoot the shit, maybe do some sketches. I might write a spooky story like I did last year. We'll see how it's going to be, but uh, a little bit more Halloween fun. All right, next thing I want to talk about is this wonderful video. Let me share my screen so you guys can hear this and see it if you're watching along on the tubes or whatever else. But I am a avid and rabid Eagles fan, as you probably know by now. You can see it in the background sometimes if I don't have my, uh, my green screen down. At the Eagles game, in the heart of Philadelphia, 
the liberty capital of the nation. Well, Jill Biden was there for something, you know, raise money for cancer, whatever it might be. To And it's funny, I was making fun of Jill Biden, right? Saying that they should boo the shit out of her. And that's what I'm going to show you is they did. They booed the shit out of Jill Biden. And my buddy said, oh, they're booing her and cancer survivors. And I said, well, that's just like, whatever, man. That's like when terrorists hide in children's hospitals. Hey, you can see it's, it's either way. That's on Jill Biden for taking, taking uh, hostages, basically, and making them come out there to get booed. But here's the video right here of them booing her. There's several other videos as well, but this is the easiest one I could find right now because the broadcast, first off, people stopped booing once she started singing Fly Eagles Fly, the chant or the fight song. Obviously, they're not going to boo their own fight song. And the networks cut away and wouldn't show this. So you're not going to see this footage on any of the networks. You had to respond to it by finding on Twitter. But here you go. Here is Joe Biden being booed. And there's a couple of the videos too I found because a buddy of mine, you know, again, I, my, I have many, many very, very progressive friends out here in LA and, uh, and on an Eagles text chain had said, where do you see that? Fox News? As though, I, I, I love this logic, as though something being on Fox News, and again, I don't watch any television news. I think it's all pure trash. I don't watch any television news. Everything I read is online. It's either on Fox News. Like I will read foxnews.com. I'll go to New York Post you know, for conservative news. I'll go to Huffington Post if I want to see what the lefties are saying or CNN. I'll read all of it. And that's what we do. Again, $15 level on our Patreon, how he composes news links. We get hundreds a day from both sides of the spectrum. It's the best news breakdown you're ever going to get for everything you need to know in the world right now. But I digress. My buddy's saying, well, it's weird. It's from Fox News. Who the fuck cares if it's on Fox News, guy? It's reporting people on the ground. Uh, hundreds of people are tweeting about this. But it doesn't. It didn't happen because Fox News is what is reporting it. So I had to find him several Twitter feeds that are a live video of her getting booed at the game. The reason why this is so amazing, though, is that Philadelphia, man, that is a blue city, right? Now Pennsylvania went for Trump because Pennsylvania, as a state, obviously encompasses a lot of coal, right? Pennsylvania's got a lot of those natural resources and a lot of these smaller towns that were based upon manufacturing, they're based upon coal mining, they're based upon, you know, very rural places that are between the big cities. Pennsylvania, which is where I'm from, I'm from outside of Philly, you got the big cities, big suburbs surrounding Philly, big city of Pittsburgh, city surrounding that, and then you have, you know, State College, where Penn State is, where I went in the middle, and Harrisburg, which is, you know, a rinky-dink, it's the capital, just because it's in the middle of the state, but it's rinky-dink. Everywhere else, though, in that state is, you know, very, very rural. However, the cities are super blue, as most cities are, especially on the coasts, right? So Philadelphia, to have these Philadelphia fans come in there, and it's not just people from the suburbs, it's people from all walks in Philly, all races in Philly. Primarily, Philly is black and white, but you got, you know, you got your mixes in there. To see them all booing Jill Biden because Joe Biden is such a clown because they don't want to see her face because they don't want to have the high taxes, the high inflation rates, the supply chain issues. They don't want to hear shit out of her mouth. That's really telling. I mean, that is really, really telling in a city like Philadelphia. So awesome to see it. And uh, again, Jill, stop hiding behind cancer patients. Is that what you got your doctorate in? Being a coward? Hmm. One must shake his head. Next thing I want to talk about, two more items, then we'll get into uh, talking to my buddy Adam. George Floyd's family is suing Ye, a.k.a. Kanye, for $250 million. Why? Because Kanye went on a show, he was talking, who was he talking to? I don't know. He was on uh, Drink Champs, the Drink Champs podcast. I don't know what that is. But he was on this talking about Derek Floyd, or I'm sorry, George Floyd, and uh, argued that Floyd had died of fentanyl, not from the pressure put on him from Derek Chauvin. The family didn't like it. Now, this is his opinion. 
Kanye West is not a doctor. Kanye West is simply giving his opinion based upon the data that he has read. Now, despite the fact that the court might have found that the police were liable, there is actually a pretty decent you know, set of data, let's say, that could argue that Floyd did in fact die more from fentanyl than from the police actions. I still think that either way, it's a tragedy. Either way, the police are still very much culpable for his death because they didn't do anything about it. They were still sitting on him. Whether or not their pressure on his neck and his, his chest led to his death directly or indirectly because he was overdosing on fentanyl at the time and thus his body systems, his heart were under pressure, made more by the pressure from the cops, the anxious and, and anxiety of the situation, being hard to breathing, etc. These things all had together. But Kanye is not out of bounds saying fentanyl caused his death when you look at the facts of the case. That doesn't matter anymore, right? Having an opinion doesn't matter anymore if you are a mainstream media in the uh, the popular sense. Or a mainstream person, person, I should say. Mainstream personality in the popular sense. And you have a platform like Kanye does. Kanye, Kanye just bought Parler, by the way. He now owns Parler, which is fascinating in its own right. Right, the Kanye West has now bought Parler. I don't know if that means Parler is going to blow up or not. If that's going to become the new Black Twitter, that'd be pretty funny and actually probably the best thing, uh, best thing for conversation. But the family of George Floyd now looking over at Alex Jones and the fucking bizarre, bullshit, completely politicized decision to award the families from the Sandy Hook shootings which Alex Jones had said on his show these you know these kids were crisis actors. He had questioned whether or not it really happened. I'll wait. I'll finish my point. I'll get back to it. The family's looking over at the nearly $1 billion, which is, by the way, $300 million more than fucking Pfizer was ordered to pay victims in what they call the opioid crisis or lying about the opioid and addicted rates and pushing that, that drug, like pushing Oxycontin out. Remember that. Alex Jones is paying $300 million more than Pfizer. George Floyd's family who, by the way, has already been compensated by the state very handsomely at the, you know, at the cost of the taxpayers, now is going to try to sue Kanye West for $250 million fucking dollars. Because what? Because what? The damage to George Floyd's name? George Floyd, I'm sorry, was not a good person. He didn't deserve to die the way he died. He was not a good person. There's multiple reasons that he would have been arrested, including battery of a pregnant woman, including you know, armed robbery. But he was made into an icon because the culture wanted it at the time, or I should say the elites leading the culture wanted it at the time. So if anything, George Floyd has gotten the benefit of that above and beyond any fucking reasonable uh, amount of you know, anybody that was in his position in any other position of time, any other place, any other circumstance would never have become elevated to the point where he has statues, statues for this man. But Kanye West can't besmirch his good name on a fucking podcast without these assholes suing him for $250 million. This would not have happened without the Alex Jones verdict. And this is why not only is it poisonous and politicized, I said, to, to argue somehow that each of the families of the Sandy Hook, you know, students, again, who have already been paid by the state, should get, what, $27 million each from Alex Jones because he was talking about his opinion about them on a platform is fucking insane. These people, the people in the jury hated Alex Jones, so that's what they did. It's politicized, right? Nothing to do with fact, nothing to do with reasonable amounts. Just like when they give out, you know, $50 million dollars to some asshole at Chipotle that got laid off and said that it was racism. This is insane. It sets an unbelievably dangerous precedent. No, that, but you extend this now to anybody that has an opinion about anything that goes on a major platform. Is everybody now liable to be sued? Because if nothing else, the lawyers and the legal fees alone of having to defend yourself are problematic. Now, I guess you'll say, well, it's only going to be the people that have tons of money and huge voices. Okay, why is that better? That makes it okay? No, it doesn't make it okay. It makes it, you know, George Floyd's family, obviously, are just looking to get money off of the death of George Floyd. It's probably the most that he's ever done to support the family, if we're being perfectly honest. So sure, makes sense that they're going to go after it. But still, this is poisoned. It's poisoned the legal well. We already have a justice system that's completely broken and corrupt. This, this new form of, who even knows, it's censorship by uh, extortion, legal extortion, 
I mean, it sets such an unbelievably unsustainable precedent and is such a chilling effect on people having opinions outside of one mainstream narrative. But even beyond that, right, if Alex Jones can have to pay a billion dollars for his opinion, where the fuck is the media? Why is the media not? Nick Sandman got paid out because the media, and I go, they're two different things. Alex Jones didn't know for a fact that Sandy Hook was or wasn't what he was saying. He was giving his opinion, his conspiracy theory on what he thought it could be. It's not like when CNN and the New York Post and all these other places trash Nick Sandman, right? Who famously had been smirking at an Indian protester, but then those news outlets selectively edited their video. They selectively edited what they showed the population to create a story, right? That to me is different from having a theory, a conspiracy theory that you give your opinion on. Because one is intent to obfuscate the truth that is black and white in front of you on video, and one is somebody putting together pieces to develop their own theory or concept on what's happening. Now, if we can't come up with alternative narratives, then we don't have a real fucking problem here. And to the, to the extent, like the Nick Salmon stuff, if the media, which constantly lies, constantly gives opinions that are wrong, why can't Donald Trump sue CNN and every other place for... $75 billion, because guess what? They created the Russia hoax out of whole cloth. It was nothing for fucking years. It was nothing. And now you could say that man, they didn't know. They put together the pieces as they came out to develop their own theories. They gave their opinions. They had pundits on them. Okay, then why can't he sue every single one of them? What if you have a theory that you honestly believe and it turns out to just be wrong? Are we not allowed to be wrong anymore as a society? Now, I'm not saying that you shouldn't hold people accountable if they do damage to your reputation by coming out with these allegations that are, in fact, calculably wrong, right? If they're just intentionally misleading the population. But that's why you do have libel cases like with Johnny Depp and Amber Heard, where it's a he, sh he said, she said, but you hear it out, okay, and then you say, here are the damages. You're telling me that the damages from having a conspiracy theory, that a that total of billion dollars is somehow in the realm of, of reasonability? that it's not going to have this domino effect? Hell no. And now it puts anybody, it puts me at risk, you know, giving my opinions on a podcast about what could be going on in the world, about what I've said about Zelensky in Ukraine, what I've said about you know, Epstein. Am I going to get sued by somebody in the Epstein family now because I've said that the man didn't, kill, you know, that he didn't kill himself and that he was running a fucking pedophile sex ring? It certainly seems possible now, doesn't it? God forbid. Anyway, it's just unbelievably fucked up. And George Ford's family is just despicable. Uh, okay, so the next thing, the final thing, and I'm hoping to actually get this man on the show because I would be fascinated to talk to him, is that you may have heard a candidate in New York City running as an independent uh, for Congress in, let's see, he's running against Jerry Nadler, New York's uh, 12th district. His name's Mike Itkus a self-described liberal independent. Well, Mike, in what I would say is a stroke of genius, released a sex tape as a measure of uh, getting attention for his candidacy. First time I can think of it being done. Now, maybe there's sex tapes. I'm sure, I'm sure there's sex tapes that exist for other candidates. I just talked about Jeffrey Epstein. I think that's the sole reason why that uh, Jeffrey Epstein had his houses and his underage prostitutes around to create sex tapes for blackmail. I'm sure JFK has plenty of them as well. But first time proactively releasing a sex tape of one's own uh, endeavors, as we'll say, to raise awareness for a candidacy and for a cause. Now, Mike Itkus is described as, as uh, being very sex positive, right? I would say probably going for the fact that he wants to... Uh, now, let me see. I want to go to his actual site to make sure I'm getting this right. Because like I said, I want to get him on. Domestic policy and a sex positive approach actively oppose the conservative idea that sex should only happen between a man and a woman. Fine. Right to not become a parent in case of pregnancy. Okay. Um, abortion rights for women. Men should not be required to support biological children without prior, prior agreement. Interesting. Okay. And government involvement in marriage. I can get behind that. Decriminalizing sex between consenting adults, private property rights, defining consent, ending adultery laws, and decriminalize and legalize sex work. I can get behind all these things. And I think that it is a actually, like I said, a stroke of genius to put out this sex tape because if you're talking about decriminalizing, like he's putting it out there. 
He's saying, I'm willing to put my money where my mouth is. I believe in this cause. Here's me doing the do. And I don't think that this woman I'm with, who is taking part in paid sex acts, right, should be in fear of her career, in fear of being taken away, or children being taken away, in fear of being incarcerated, whatever you want to say, for taking part in two voluntary or in a voluntary interaction between two consenting adults. I think it's great. It certainly got him a lot of attention. I certainly hope that I can get him on the podcast to talk about it. But it also sends a message. It's like, again, kind of like reminds you of this, the soup thing. We were debating the soup throwing on Van Gogh on our Mufasa call last night. Because as opposed to dumping milk out, which I think is just asinine and making people hate you, you know, well, we're worried about milk farming emissions. So I'm going to dump gallons of milk out in the middle of the supermarket and piss everybody off. Doesn't win you any converts. You set your moving back 20 years. Throwing soup on the Van Gogh painting is asinine, but at the same point, I get the message. The message is that you are spending more time and effort conserving this piece of painting than in preserving and conserving humanity and what we need to survive. Now, I don't personally believe that, but if you did, it's a salient message. And for those people that might be on the fence, it's a, it's a message that works. It makes sense. This message, I think, works. It's certainly got him attention. Now, Mike is probably not going to win the election. I think Mike would probably acknowledge that himself. But creating a sex tape, putting it out on Pornhub, right? It's not like he put this out on mainstream TV. It's not on public access. He put it on a porn website, so he's not breaking any laws. You can voluntarily go to watch it. He's not forcing you to watch it. He's not sneaky linking it in <laughs> so, so people are getting on it. He's not pushing it to kids. Adults can go and watch his porno website great i think it's absolutely brilliant and i think it makes a very good point and i think that the man is is pretty damn ballsy for doing it so we'll see if i can get him on the show i like more sex tapes from candidates unless you're hillary clinton then no thank you don't need to see it don't want to hear about it don't want to hear the noises you make don't want to see if the burlap grinding on each other ends at your pantsuit or if it continues on to your vagina all right. <laughs> Imagine sex with Luke Clinton. <laughs> uh, okay. All right, guys. Uh, I'm going to do a quick transition into uh, talking with Adam Choit. So stay tuned for that. All right, guys, as mentioned at the top of the show, I'm back here at the end of the show, the bottom, some would say it, with a buddy of mine who I don't think is a bottom, but I don't like to pry, and that is the only Adam Choit. What's shaking, bud? Oh, thank you for having me on. I appreciate it. We'll see where the conversation where the conversation goes, but uh, yeah, thank you. I, mean, I appreciate it. Yeah, you always want to explore. I mean, there is that uh, senatorial candidate that released a porno video. I don't know if you heard about that. <laughs> is it helping the candidate? The candidate I, I don't know. I'm trying to get him on the show. I, I legitimately sent an in, uh, it's like sent an email to his publicity team saying I want to get this guy. His name's Mike Mike Itkus. He's running as an independent in New York, and I want to have him on. But he released a, a legitimate sex tape on Pornhub because um, he's you know into sex positivity, and I'm guessing probably also legalization legalization of sex work. So there's always a porn star or stripper on the California ballot or for governor or something. There's always oh yeah. Um, Someone from the adult business running, I think. Oh, yeah. Well, this guy's not in the business. That's what makes it so great. He's not even in the biz. But anyway, that's neither here nor there. I support, he did. I support independent <laughs> film. I support independent that was, film. <laughs> that was going to be my transition. That is what we're going to talk about, is that Adam got uh, the opportunity to create a film, short film, through the Talesian or Talesian Nexus, which, first, first question, are they still around? Are they still a thing? They are not around anymore. Okay, they, did not, think, yeah. they did not survive 2020. Um, I know Emergent Order. I'm not, I'm not super familiar with them, but that's sort of another organization. I think mm -hmm. they're Austin-based. That's sort of doing some similar things. I haven't been in touch with them in a minute. But Taliesin Nexus is... is Taliesin, nice. that's it. I can never remember how to say that fucking yeah. word. Taliesin. He's spilling over here, but we good. Yeah. 
Uh, so Taliesin Nexus. So you had you had worked with these guys. Now this was an organization that gave you know basically they're trying to foster more filmmakers that would work within the Liberty space and try to get them in the industry, teach them the the lay of the land, how did the process work. So tell me a little bit about how you got involved with them and, and what you went through in developing this concept, which is for a film which just had its debut officially. It's a, it's online debut. It's been in some festivals, but it's called The Edited, and uh, that'll be in the show notes, guys. And uh, tell me a little bit about it, and I'll uh, I'll just gonna play this uh, in the background so you can see some video for those of you who are watching on Rumble or the Mean Age Daydream YouTube as we talk. Oh, very cool. Um, well, Talies and Nexus, they were they like you said support liberty minded creatives, and they did some programs with uh, like authors and and uh, even beyond just uh, filmmakers. But in 2015, I applied for a fellowship that was about like, and I did the, did the fellowship went through it was about like pitching and and storytelling, really a storytelling based thing. And then I then I applied for what they called their Liberty Lab and then I think Smash Cut Lab, which is like the the short film grant where you get to write and direct or produce depending on what your your track was uh, a short film. And I was able to be lucky enough to be selected to write and direct this film, which definitely did the edited, which went through a rigorous editing and, and <laughs> development process pre-production uh yeah uh, i I, I remember you telling me about it like it wasn't it, this wasn't your original concept was it i think you said like something like you had to go back and they wanted to completely retool it and make it completely different right at the time i was working on developing a pilot for like a show that was basically about um a school of zombies where the kids in, in a school are all zombies and then through the development process, that that sort of evolved into the school in this story, which is, you know, in within a, a world where the curriculum is constantly being edited to falsehoods to, uh, you know, propagate the powers that be in this uh, society. Yeah. So Similar yeah, a, little a little bit, bit to our society, our current society, a little bit, perhaps. Yeah, I would say quite close. Yeah. Tell me a little bit more about how you came up with the idea for this and and. Uh, what went into creating the story and then uh, even into, you know, kind of the production. What's funny, too, and, and I want to talk about some of the actors that were cast because I know two of them. Um, I know Melissa Shoshani and Samantha Hale. And Samantha's definitely on the left side of things. Melissa, I would say, is on the right side of things. But uh, I'm leaping ahead. So tell me a little bit more about how you came around to to this design specifically. Design meaning that, like the well, this concept, the I should say. The, no, the, the concept, yeah, the the concept behind it. Well, really, it was it really was that development process with with uh, someone ma named uh, Patrick Reasonover, who was at Talias and X at the time, and Matt Matt Edwards and Victoria over there, and other writers and creatives who who served as mentors, and just through conversations with them, and just like really diving into the weeds with the with the story, and trying to figure out what works and what was the 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 crucial things that we wanted to was to say with this, and one thing just sort of evolved in, into the next, and I kept going back to the drawing board and draft after draft until we were we were really happy with with uh with what we had and, and we're ready to to begin shooting it yeah so then let's talk about the casting um did you have a lot to say in the casting process did you basically just kind of let it go and was there a casting agent you worked with or how did that process go along so like i said a lot of them are comedians in here um samantha melissa i think matt larson is also a comedian that got cast in this which is fairly straight. I mean, it's not a, a comedy per se, you know, it's pretty, pretty straight on as far as the way it's presented. So tell me a little bit more about that. Well, it's funny because first of all, I am, I love stand up comedy. I'm friends with a lot of comedians and a lot of comedians who are actors as well. And I just really wanted to work with uh, comedians, but th you know, when I wrote this script for this, this, this film on paper, I was like, I'm making idiocracy. I'm making something in that tone <laughs> inspired by that sort of in that, in that, in that vein. But then when I looked at what was shot and I started to work with the, my composer, Risto, who did a great job and we were bouncing around ideas and I and I kept, you know, kicking him back into the into the uh, into the uh, into the dungeon to come up with new stuff. <laughs> Eventually, I, you know, we both kind of came to the conclusion or I did as well that we made more of a black mirror type episode and, and something with that tone than in than in, uh, in idiocracy, I would say. So that definitely. Uh, help steer steer uh, where this went ultimately in terms of the tone. But the casting, I just really wanted to work with comedians. And I figured the adults, it ended up working. All the kids were sort of found through 
through a casting, the agents, you know, the agency or the database or whatever, you know, where that comes from, central yeah, casting, central LA casting, cast. right? Yeah, right, LA cast, whatever it is. And then, and I, but I was familiar with my, I did, I did know my lead, uh, Tristan Neighbors, who did an amazing mm -hmm. job in the film. Uh, previously, we had, we had met. Um, um, but uh, other than that, the, the the kids were all casted through through the process, and the, the actors were the, the adult actors were comedians I knew or friends of comedians I knew, and and kind of went from there. Yeah, it's awesome. Well, then you know, let's talk a little bit about some you know kind of things that people could take away. If somebody wants to get into doing this, how hard was it? And I know this is your first time going through it, and people out there, you know, like you said, Talisa ne Nexus isn't even around, or Taliesa Nexus isn't around anymore. There's this other organization. There might be some other opportunities, but if they wanted to do it. What went into making it happen? How difficult was it if somebody wanted to make something like this on their own? Oh, uh, it is. Well, it, it depends because it's I mean, it's definitely difficult. This took a, took a, a, a few bucks to make and I'm lucky enough to get funding and support for, for that. But really, it's just I think about just putting yourself out there. You don't have to do something that's like high production value per se to get to get attention if your if your story is great. And there's equipment, obviously, you could you could rent. Um, I mean, that's a, that's a tough question to answer. There's no there's no short answer to that. Right. I would say write a great write a great write a great script and, and don't don't write in a in a in a vacuum alone. Share share your work with others who you trust, who are like minded, who have a writer brain, who have a liberty minded brain, whose opinion you you respect. And then, you know, if you have something great on paper that people are excited about. I think that's the the first step towards getting getting others interested in it, whether it be actors, producers, people to finance it. Yeah, that's all. His questions. Yeah, people to finance. But like you said, I mean, there's a lot of tools out there now. You know, you can edit with iMovie. You've got your iPhone or your Google, you know, Google Pixel, whatever it might be, that are legitimately. I mean, cinema quality, you know, like we talk now about these commercials that are coming out and it says shot on iPhone, but I have people that I work with in the production community and my public relations job. They're complaining now because all these creatives just want to shoot on the iPhone. They just want to shoot with their iPhone and they're like, this is number one, going to kill our business <laughs> as production companies. But number two, that, um, you know, it does rival the quality for cameras in that you have that ability that you can just take it and shoot it. And it's in 4K and you can edit it on your own. And, and yeah, you can legitimately put it out there with any, any of the myriad distribution platforms. I mean, we're currently banned for posting on YouTube, but that's what Rumble's for and Odyssey and, you know, and everything else. Am I going to be banned from? Am I going to be uh, canceled for making a movie about cancel culture? Essentially, no, or, I would or say not? nothing more appropriate than that. So I would right. say ninety nine percent probability. <laughs> we'll see where things things take me. Yeah. So what are you working on now, man? You know, tell people a little bit. Uh, you know, obviously you can talk about your podcast. You do your you know you run your comedy shows. But is there anything else in the works as far as this goes too? Do you have other scripts that you're working on? Has this inspired you to to create your own content outside of uh, the production process you just went through? Um, I'm working on developing this into a, something more, a long form story. And, and right now a feature, um, people are asking for a series. We'll see maybe a feature <laughs> then a series, maybe, you know, we'll, we'll see where things take me, but I am, I am writing, I am working on it, developing the feature and, and maybe more inspired by this or something kind of based on this world. I don't know if it's going to pick up exactly where the, uh, the short film left off, but I definitely want to continue to, to dive deeper into this story. And I have a couple of other scripts and, in the can that probably need more work that I should should dive back into, but <laughs> definitely writing is is the big thing and trying to trying to stick with that right now and, and kind of go from there and see where see you know where things happen go with this film. I'm kind of continuing to to try to promote it and put it out there and get eyeballs on it. As of recording this, I only put it out there three days ago, so right. letting it marinate a little bit, exploring some other uh, marketing opportunities. Just uh, we'll see where things go. Being open. Yeah, awesome. Well, again, guys, the edited, you can find it on YouTube. I will put the link in the show notes for this episode. You can easily just click through and find it. And uh, do you want to tell me about your other podcast or anything while you're sure, here? Sure, I, I can go quick through through, through my other plugs. Yeah. Um, everything is, you can just follow me on Instagram at Adam Choit or my link tree, link tree, blah, 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 slash Adam Choit. Um, I have a podcast I host too. One is called People We Love. And what I do with that one is interview people from all walks of life. Most often comedians and other entertainment types, but not exclusively that, uh, about their lives and careers, casual conversation. But I also ask everyone to highlight the people they love who've inspired them, 
who've influenced them. That's been super fun. I've had more liberty minded people on uh, lately. That's kind of where my life has taken me a little bit. And also I'm going to kind of use that as a you know, vehicle to promote uh, the film as well. I'm hoping to get my actress, uh, my lead actor, uh, Tristan Neighbors on soon. I've interviewed pretty much everyone else from the cast at this point mm -hmm. on the podcast. But that's been cool. People who love podcast.com at people who love podcast. And my other podcast is called Tedeschi Trucks Podcast. And it's all about my favorite band, a 12 piece rock, blues, soul, powerhouse band, Tedeschi Trucks Band. Susan Tedeschi is a lead singer, and guitar player. Derek Trucks, her husband, is a virtuoso uh, slide guitar player. I've been following them pretty much since they came around in 2010. Um, that's just been fun as I dive deeper and deeper into that subculture. I feel like I'm lucky to be part of these like different subcultures but at tedeschi trucks podcast if you're interested in blues rock soul type music you should be they are the best band on the road right now touring it's not up for debate um t-e-d-e-s-c-h-i trucks podcast at tedeschi trucks podcast um comedy show november 12th pasadena information about that on my instagram the flyers up uh tickets eventbrite cheap fun show good lineup great lineup david lucas Seth Lawrence, Darius Culpepper, hosted by Davina Joy. Um, I think that's is that that's that's is that an, is that enough? That's plenty. Yeah, that, that's good, man. All the right. Well, that's movie. awesome. Com, the edited movie. Yes. That um, the embedded YouTube videos there as well. Trailer clips, the whole nine yards. Beautiful. All right, man. Well, awesome uh, catching up with you. Congrats on the film and its uh, debut online. I hope it gets a lot of clicks and obviously you continue on and uh, develop it further. Otherwise, guys, that's going to do it for me from Mr. Adam Choit and from me and Age Daydream. Don't forget to support us on Patreon, patreon.com forward slash Lions of Liberty. And don't forget to subscribe to the Me and Age Daydream YouTube channels. Follow us on Rumble, as I mentioned. We are currently still banned for posting on YouTube on our Lions of Liberty account. So go find us on other ways. And don't forget to listen to the boring podcast, the uh, comedy podcast I do bi-weekly, B-O-H-R-I-N-G. All right, guys, have a good one from me, Brian McWilliams, from Adam, and from uh, me, Nage Daydream. Keep those electric eyes on me, babe, and keep that ray gun to my head.